this video is going to show you how to fill in an ICAO flight plan for your private pilot or your commercial pilot flight test. So first of all, you're going to have to get yourself a copy of the ICAO flight plan. And if you have one in front of you, great. And if you don't, uh, I suggest you go find one, print it out, and I'll try to post a link below, but links expire. So hopefully you can be able to find one. And as per usual, you don't actually need me for any of this. You can find all the information I'm about to give you in the AIM, and I do recommend that you look it up under RAC Section 3, and you'll find all of the details on how to fill out the ICAO flight plan in that section. Now, when you file a flight plan with FIC, they typically prompt you, so you don't get used to filing an ICAO flight plan unless you're doing it all the time, um, but they will ask you to include the information below, and this is again pulled directly from the AIM, um, so it's not a secret as to where I got this information, um, but they will prompt you for this information. However, uh, like I said, for your flight test, you're going to want that ICAO sheet just so that it's done so you don't lose any points, um, and the examiner can check off that you've done the flight plan for the test. Okay, so let's dive right into how you fill out this form. You actually don't fill out the very top. You start here down over at ID aircraft identification. This is the full ident, including the Charlie in the front with no dashes. So for example, if your call sign is typically Golf Alpha Bravo Charlie, include the C in front. Next is flight rules. You are a VFR aircraft, so you put the V in the front. That's all you need to know. For type of flight, this is a flight plan, not a flight itinerary. So this is the only time you leave the first box blank. Otherwise, you always start filling out these boxes from the left-hand side. Over to the right here, you fill in G for general aviation. Pretty simple. Next, moving over, you have number of aircraft. I sincerely hope it's one. And then for type of aircraft, you have your ICAO designation. So if you don't know your ICAO designation, I'll post the website link down below. You just look it up. But for example, if you're flying a Cessna 172, this is what it looks like, C-172 easy done. For wake turbulence category, I sincerely hope for your flight test you are flying a light aircraft, so just put L in there for that, and we'll move on to the next section. Equipment codes can be a little overwhelming, but the gist of it is that they want to know what you have on board for equipment. So if you don't have anything on board, no comm, no nav, no approach aid equipment, put an N. But if you're flying a flight school plane, you probably have a comm unit, a nav unit, and some sort of approach aid equipment. So put S in that first part of the box. And then if you are flying with a GPS, for example, because we're not IFR, doesn't have to be a certified IFR GPS. So if you do use it and you know how to use it and you have it on board, you can include it here in the equipment codes. If you're flying out of class Charlie airspace, you probably have a mode C transponder and it is functional. So for this part, you include a slash C to denote your transponder type. If you have a really fancy airplane, you might have a slash S transponder, but I would ignore that for now. And uh, you probably just have a class C transponder, so put dash C in this box. For the departure aerodrome, they're gonna want the four letter code. So I know that we typically shorten them to three letters, YYC, YYZ. Just make sure that you put the Charlie in front. Otherwise, um, you might be coding it as a uh, a beacon. So typically, if it's a directional beacon, it'll only be three letters as opposed to the airport. So put the C in front. Next, then you have time. And of course, this is in UTC. So make sure that you're putting in the right time of departure and you're giving it to them in Zulu time. For this section, you're going to put in your initial cruising speed and your initial altitude. So not what you plan to do the whole flight at, but just what you plan to start at. And then for cruising speed, you typically think I believe in knots as most people do if you have a plane that has everything denoted in miles per hour you might struggle with this section because you'll have to convert everything to knots however most airplanes we think about and do all our calculations in knots and remember this is true airspeed so use the letter n to denote knots k actually stands for kilometers in sections so don't use k use n and then it's four digits following the n so if your speed your true airspeed that you're planning for is 95 knots you want to put the nine and the five in the very last part of the box with zeros in front if your cruising speed is 100 knots it's going to be n zero one zero zero then with the altitude section, you want to put the initial planned cruising altitude as A, which will denote your altitude in feet. Um, and then you want to follow that with three digits. So for example, if your initial planned altitude is going to be 4,500, you drop the last two zeros and you would put in this box the following, A, zero, four, five, 
and that would be a starting altitude of 4,500 feet. If it's 3,500 feet, you would write A035, etc. If it's an ICAO flight plan, which is this is supposed to be, you can actually put for VFR flights um, just VFR in that box instead of putting your altitude. So it would look just like that. I've never done it that way. I've always put the altitude in feet in that first box. So whichever you prefer, it should be okay with your examiner. So the next part here talks about your routing. Now, since this is a VFR flight, you're probably not going to be using an ATS route. And you're not probably not going to be following like IFR routes or GPS routes. So basically what they want you to denote here is changes of speed, level, or track. So if you're going to be changing your speed, your altitude, or your heading or track, then they would want you to put the, the uh, GPS location in here. They also want you to use points not normally more than 30 minutes flying or 200 nautical miles apart, which kind of makes sense if you're putting a route in here. So uh, the way they want you to write this information in is they want latitude and longitude coordinates. Now you can use the seven digit format as shown here. So just on 49 North and 122 West to denote the next position that you will be changing your track and or your heading and or your altitude. If you didn't want to use latitude and longitudinal points, you can also include this information as bearing and distance from a significant point. But I find at this level of flying, that's a little confusing. And PPL and CPL were probably better at just making a spot on the map and looking up the longitudinal and latitudinal coordinates and just using those on your, on your IKO flight plan. For changes in altitude, they actually want it denoted in this specific way. So they want the geographical point at which you're going to change your altitude, followed by an oblique slash, followed by N to denote knots, 0095 to denote 95 knots, as we used before. Um, so all I'm showing you is that if you're going to put your speed, it doesn't have to be 95 knots, but whatever your speed you're going to be maintaining um, after that change in altitude, even if it doesn't change, they want you to note it and they want you to denote it in this format. And then you follow it by A030 to denote a change to an altitude of 030 or 3000 feet. Um, and that's how they want you to write that change in altitude. So that's basically how they want you to do your routing. They want you to put point to point to point in geographical denotations of where you are in longitude and latitude. And they want changes of altitude shown in this format following the geographical point at which you're going to start that change of altitude. What I've shown you here is the seven uh, digit way of showing your geographical point. You can also write it in 11 characters. I suggest that whichever one you decide, the seven or the 11, um, that you just keep it in the same format the whole way. But it's, again, it's up to you because these are the two ways that you can do it. So seven characters is definitely less precise. 11 is more precise and really it's up to you. One last thing I want to talk about quickly is if you're planning an extended cruise climb, then you'd want to denote that by putting the following in your flight routing section, the letter C followed by, again, the oblique stroke. And then you want to put the geographical point at which the cruise climb is planned to start expressed the same way. So the seven digits, longitude and latitude, and then the speed to be maintained during that cruise climb expressed as we talked about before. Now, in the example they used in the AIM, they put mock numbers. We're not flying that fast. So uh, I suggest that you use, you know, the way we talked about before. So put your speed in knots as you would expect to be flying during that cruise climb into your airspeed, as well as the altitude that it starts at your cruise climb and the altitude that it ends at. Um, and then you would denote that in your routing section um, along with your other geographical points. Moving right along, you have your destination aerodrome, again, using that ICAO four-letter code. And because you've done your navigation log, you should have a estimated time en route expressed in days, hours, and minutes. And then if you want to change the search and rescue time, you would include it here. Otherwise, it would just default to the one hour after your expected time of arrival. And of course, we're flying VFR, so we don't need an alternate. So you can just leave these blank if you so desire. And then last thing, for other information, it does recommend that you put a zero if there is no other information to include. And this is specifically with regards to your air aircraft equipment. So now we move on to the search and rescue part of the forum, starting with item 19. And the first one here talks about endurance. So whenever FIC asks you how much fuel you have on board, they never care about how many gallons you have. Every aircraft burns a different amount of fuel. So you want to put the amount of time you have aloft. 
given the amount of fuel that you're carrying. So if you are flying, say, at 172 and you burn eight gallons per hour and you've got 16 gallons on board, then you've got two hours of endurance. And you write this down in terms of hours and minutes. The next part here, we're going to do a lot of crossing off. So person, we'll, we'll start with persons on board. You put Usually it's two, um, but however many souls on board you have, you put in this box. And then it talks about what kind of equipment you have. So in this section here, we've already put equipment that we have on board the aircraft in the earlier part of the form. This part of the form only asks about emergency ex equipment. So they're specifically asking if you are able to transmit and receive on frequency 1215. That's the VF VHF section here. So if you have a VHF radio you, and you're able to broadcast on 1215, you would not cross this out. I crossed out UHF because typically these airplanes that we fly for the PPL and CPL, they don't have the UHF uh, radio on board and therefore you wouldn't have it and you just cross it off. You cross off in this section here, you cross off any item that you do not have on board or you are unable to use. For an ELT, obviously you would have one on board and then um, you would have the type. So for type, in most of the cases that you'll find in most light aircraft, it's an automatic fixed. So put AF. Now, when you're filing a flight plan with FIC, they always want to know if it's 406 or 121.5. Most of them are the newer type, which is the 406, but just verify with your flight school so that you know what to tell them. This next section specifically pertains to the survival equipment that you're carrying on board. So for example, if you are not carrying any survival equipment whatsoever, you cross it off. If it is unserviceable, you cross it off. And if you're not carrying any polar, sur uh, polar survival equipment, desert, marine, or jungle survival equipment, cross those off as well. If you are carrying any life jackets, do not cross off the J. But if you are not carrying life jackets, cross them off. Cross off the L if your life jackets are not equipped with a light. Cross off the F if they're not equipped with fluorine dye. And if you cannot use the life jackets to broadcast on a radio, cross off both the UHF and the VHF because they pertain to the radio functionality of your life jackets, not of your aircraft. This next section talks about whether or not you have dinghies on board. So if you're not carrying any at all, just cross off the D and leave the next section blank and the next section blank. And if you are not carrying any cover for the dinghy, cross off that section and leave the next section blank. This next section, however, you are going to want to fill in. It talks about your aircraft color and markings just to help it be better identifiable if, heaven forbid, search and rescue has to come and look for you. So for this one, it's uh, we just put white aircraft with light blue stripes or you can put whatever color your airplane is. And then you want to denote whether it's wheels, skis, floats, etc. Now, in this very bizarre situation, if it's a small box, when you tick it off, it actually means that that's the equipment that you have, as opposed to the previous section where you cross off the equipment that you do not have. Confusing, I know, but that's how you do it. If you have no other remarks with regards to survival equipment, just cross off the N and leave that next section blank. In the next section, you're going to need to tell them how you're going to be filing your arrival report. So for this situation, I just wrote, we're going to be closing with Pacific FIC by calling on the ground and closing our flight plan. Then in the next box, you have your search and rescue contact number and name. And then in the following boxes, you're going to be putting your name if you are pilot in command and your license number if you are pilot in command. If you're not going to be the pilot in command, you would put the name and license number of whoever it is going to be. That's it. So please bring your IKO flight plan to your flight test. Please print it out neatly and clearly. I've never had a student fail because of their IKO flight plan, but it's just easy marks for you. It makes the examiner's job easy, and I hope this video helps.